for commission you, you wouldn't require a permit to be commissioned. Uh, I, I just think we need to clarify what that permit is or change the language. Is the average cost for installing? Paragraph C2 talks about special use permit for special use approval. That's how I read it. I think a, a building permit would make more sense only because um, you put the applicant in a difficult situation by requiring that they get security before they even know that they're going to have a permit. Uh, otherwise, they could spend a lot of money on security or a cash deposit, and then you say, no, you're not getting a permit. They would have to worry about when they get building at that time. Or, uh, like I say, you could uh, change that to before any building permit is issued for any construction because then, um, you know, the thing you're most concerned about is the tower is going up. So then they'd have to have that security in place before any building permits are issued to allow that construction. And the township controls all of those building permits. It doesn't involve the county at all. Well, do you, do you contract with the county for your yeah. the county does. Yeah. Because we wouldn't want the county issuing such. Can we say the county can't issue it? I think the doesn't if I'm not mistaken, I think B handles the building permits, but it goes to the county, correct? Correct. Yeah. He got to go through. He issues. Yeah, he has to, you have to have a permit from the county. Yeah. yeah. So which comes first, the permit from Dave or a permit from the county? He, well, gives, he gives you a permit, then you have to go through the county. Okay. Yeah. So it would be our township building permit that, he, that they would need first. So they wouldn't be given that from Dave until the security right. was in yeah. place, right? Which is how that would be. And is that possible to change of it? I don't think so. I think that's our building ordinance, right. isn't it? That well, you, get a, so. you get a township so. permit before you can go to the county. Yeah, because Dave's got to make sure the zoning and all yeah. the stuff's <clears> right first. Well, here, okay, here's another option. Maybe since there's maybe some uncertainty about that process, you could say uh, the financial security must be in effect before the special use permit is effective. So ultimately, understand what, what's going to happen is we're probably going to have to work with either Paul, myself, or both of you if, if and when a project comes in and you ultimately approve it. We'll be drafting a resolution that's probably about 40 pages long for you that has all the terms and conditions of approval, one of which will say this permit is not effective until such time as the... Um, financial security has been posted. And so um, perhaps that's the easiest way to do that because the special use permit is totally within your jurisdiction and control to decide if and when it's entered. So if we say it shall be in effect before the special use permit is effective. Yeah, and uh, that may not even be necessary because as I read uh, paragraph two, it says, such financial guarantee shall be deposited or filed with the township clerk after a special use has been approved, but before construction operations begin on the WEX project. That pretty much says what we're saying right here. And maybe we just uh, uh, take out the wording in the prior paragraph. But that seems to be in the wrong place. Because 
we're talking about removal and paragraph two is construction of the project. What's that we want the proof that they will financially cover the removal before they even start? Isn't that the goal of all of this verbiage right here? I think this is an instance where you know we're trying to do a lot of drafting on the spot. I think we all know what we want to do here is we don't want them building anything until the financial security is approved and in place. And to the extent Paul needs to sit down with us after the fact to make sure it says that and reconcile these provisions, I think we've got the direction we need. Okay. So basically this is just kind of a cleaned up because yeah, this is um, kind of putting the cart before the horse. I'm working on it. And again, in paragraph two, um, there are several references to applicant owner, applicant, um, and owner. So, uh, and then again in paragraph three. So, uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the word applicant in those cases. What we might want to do, and this, this is just a thought, Paul and I can talk about it, but we might want a, another definition in the ordinance that's responsible party and define that to include whatever entity, whether it be the applicant, the owner, or the operator who has the legal authority to take such steps as required under the ordinance at the time that obligation arises. And then just use the term responsible party every place where that occurs. Except for at the application stage where you're obviously it's the applicant but can they then point fingers, like he said? It's well, not, not me, it's him? <laughs> well, ultimately, I mean, somebody's going to have responsibility, and you know, the, the township can um, figure out who that is. Um, it's, is it complicated because you're sitting on private land? Well, necessarily, um, the uh, the applicant, if it's a wind company, is going to have to uh, submit with its application proof of the landowner's consent to the application and agreement to be bound by all the terms and, and conditions uh, of the permit. Uh, and that's typical in any situation. You know, a lot of times you have developers come in and seek rezoning, and you don't allow them to do that unless they've got proof of the landowner's consent uh, to the the application. You would do the same here and require all the participating landowners to join in the application and therefore they're going to be uh, bound and, and subject to whatever uh, requirements of the ordinance um, that um, uh, you know might require access to the property and whatnot to complete. Because it says on down there, you know, it says the Payment of all attorney fees and costs incurred by the township. I mean, is that, that the structure is not voluntarily removed? You know, it's on, it's on private land, so ultimately, I just want to see the township get hung for any of this. Right. So ultimately, it's on private land. I just don't know why we're, we're not tying in the, the landowner, too. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is we will, uh, you know, that's part of the application process, right? You could not, uh, it would not be proper for the township to approve a special land use permit for wind turbine on property that the private property owner has not joined in and consented to that application. Well, I think Rick's talking more about having a lien against the property for decommissioning when it all comes down to it. There's very limited circumstances in Michigan where you can actually put a lien on somebody's property for these types of obligations. And I 
suggest you do not do that because you're wading into probably illegal waters if you do that. There's, there's a number of statutes that specifically authorize that being done, which implicates the idea that unless there's statutory authority, you can't do it. So just for example, there was a, um, a company that actually put a lien against property because, I don't know if it was Apex or another wind company, did not pay them for their work done. So they started right. putting liens on the landowner's property. Yeah, that's probably a construction lien, which mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. subject covered and authorized and subject to the Construction Lien Act where if a uh, contractor is on job, give uh, appropriate notices and record them on the project and uh, don't pay their subcontractors, the, 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 the persons who are licensed doing work on that project can put a lien on the property. And then they get like 10 cents on the dollar. I knew of a situation like that. Yeah. that that's probably just a practical uh, um, outcome rather than you know, they could potentially collect the full amount of Construction law to go with the construction. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the situation you're talking about is if Apex hires ABC Construction Company to put together the um, storage shed on the property, then Apex doesn't pay them. Perhaps ABC Construction Company could put a construction lien on the property. But that's not the same thing as the township uh, saying you didn't take down your tower, so now we're going to lien your property for the cost of removing it. There's not any sort of statute that authorizes that. I mean, what, what would happen in that situation, worst case scenario, there's a breach, decommissioning doesn't occur, the township calls on the performance bond to get the money, and the landowner somehow won't let you on the property to do it. Well, then you've got to go to district court to get a, a warrant of sorts for in, entrance to the property, which you'll get because they're required to do that to comply with the ordinance. And so, of course, going to allow the town to bond for that purpose. Still on page 34. <laughs> <laughs> resolution uh, paragraph uh, all paragraph uh, the opening paragraph uh, refers to the township board uh, establishing the process but then in paragraph a it references the planning commission shall select the complaint resolution excuse me, process, um, but then all the other references and subsequent paragraphs are back to the township board. So I'm thinking that it may be preferable to change planning commission to township board to be consistent since they're the ones that seem to be responsible for handling the complaint process. Also, in paragraph A, uh, the last sentence there, upon receiving a complaint, the township shall forward said complaint to the WEX owner. Um, administratively, that kind of puts the burden on the township. And I think it may be preferable to uh, this says there will be a form developed by the township. On the form, uh, indicate that the complaint has to be sent to the township and 
the wax cylinder so that you you don't have to be the middleman and pass it on to the, the wax owner. So I, it's just an administrative kind of thing, but it takes the burden off your shoulders. And then under paragraph C, notice of hearing shall be via certified mail. I'd suggest adding some timing and uh, recipient requirements. Okay, we're, we're saying a notice of hearing shall be sent out. Uh, who does it go to? Is it everybody within 300 feet? Is it the complainant? Um, you know, who gets it? And how much advance notice do they get? prior to the hearing. I think probably with everyone within one mile of the turban that's being complained. Is that too much? That seems to be a reach. Uh, in zoning, it's 300 feet. Right. Um, and it could also require that a notice be published uh, in the paper or the township website or something like that. So there's broader notification. Well, if it's called a public hearing, should it follow the same requirements as for yes. other public hearings? I think that makes sense. You don't have to, but I think that gives you good parameters yeah. to follow. So basically, it'd be the same parameters as a regular public hearing. Yeah. That'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people within 300 feet, and you notice there's at least 15 days before the hearing. Yeah. And where we have, in our reference was put in of notice of hearing shall be via certified mail to. It doesn't say to whom. Would that be to? Anyone within 300 feet, if what not in 300 time. feet of the turbine, of the complaint, the property line. In zoning, you would just measure 300 feet from the boundary of the property line on which the turbine is located. So it would be all yeah, like property lines. Lines. Yeah, all the non participating properties within 300 feet of the boundary of the participating property. Yeah, I think that's overkill to say certified. Even the zoning act just requires regular mail for those notices. And that's really an unnecessary expense. So we just incorporate the same requirements that are in the zoning act that yeah. ought to be sufficient. I think it should say. You, you said non-participating within 300 feet. I, I would say all. Yeah, I said yeah. I, I didn't mean to limit it that way. So okay. Assuming that the surrounding parcels are non-participating, and you got two participating parcels next to each other, and they're in the 300 feet, yeah, they'd be entitled to notice. Be a timeline on the item B. Am I not reading it right? <clears throat> well, it's kind of it's in different areas. I mean, it says if it's not operating for so long, it has to be. Um, well, that's under number 10, B. Is that, is that what you're talking about? I guess it's a decommissioner. We should be talking about decommissioner. Are we talking about decommissioner? We're under complaint resolution. Well, okay, yeah, but you're right. Yeah, okay. These are complaints. They're not necessarily decommissioned. Okay. Right. Did we already go over something on it? Well, we did, we did as far as, like, compliance with the sound and compliance with the you know, different things that they have to the changes from mitigate to they have to comply within 30 days. This, this is, is nuisance compliance. 
basically. Number nine is how you complain and how the process is done to resolve it. Number 10 is if you're told you're out of compliance, this is what you have to do. Well, item D2 has got the applicant in there and, and you gotta clean that up. It should be, shouldn't be the applicant, it should be the owner, shouldn't they? Yeah. Are you the responsible, responsible party in the yeah. primary? Yeah. 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 Under B, where it says investigation of complaints, um, this says that the township would utilize escrow funds to hire appropriate experts. What if the complaint is just a frivolous nuisance complaint? Should the applicant, should the owner be penalized to, to pay for investigating something like that? I mean, there, there no doubt can be legitimate complaints. I'm not suggesting that, but um, you know, I've seen situations in other communities where there's a neighbor that just um, likes to call the, the city or the township and complain and it just takes people's time. There's never anything to the complaint. Um, we're, we're saying the applicant has to pay for all that. Negative complaint three, four times. So how do you decide what is frivolous and not? Well, I think yeah. after investigating. Yeah. Well, the complaint could be legitimate at the time. If it was too noisy or something. You'd have to have the same conditions. To... I, I just want to bring that to your attention. No, I agree with that. Well, it yeah. says to hire the appropriate expert. Right. It doesn't say will hire an expert so that if someone says, I have a sound complaint, I have a mechanical complaint, an electrical complaint. Um, well, then there's like, they don't, don't get TV reception. There's going to be complaints. There's going to be a complaint when the truck turns the corner. It's going gonna, it's gonna to start then. And it's not going to stop. But I guess my point is there may be complaints about the legitimate operation of the use in compliance with all township requirements. Uh, trucks coming to the site or whatever it might be and somebody doesn't like the fact that the power company has a truck going down their street now. Um, you know, to me that's a nuisance complaint. It's yeah, a lot of them make them trailer truck. corners. They make a new road that ends right off. Can you ponder on that and put it into some type of word? So, <laughs> do they do that by eminent domain? Do they have access their stuff into there? Or how do they do it? Yeah. Are you going to put Try to reword that one, Paul, somehow, B, or separate to the complaint somehow. Anything else on 34? I would make one suggestion, having read this. Right now, it, it talks about that the board shall set a public hearing. Um, I think the board ought to have the discretion, uh, since there is a prior investigation, to not hold a hearing in, in situations where the township's investigation shows a complaint that is valid. Um, otherwise, you have to hold a hearing even until you hired experts and say, there's nothing to this. Uh, there would be no point in that case of holding a hearing. So instead of shall, it shall. It, uh, might want to tweak that to give them the discretionary authority to hold a hearing on what are determined to be valid complaints. What if it is a valid complaint at the time, but it isn't being replicated at the point that it's investigated? Well, by valid, I, I don't mean that, it, I mean, 
not lacking in any merit. I mean, th you're right. There's circumstances where you know the top, the, the thing's running one day and the, the shadow flicker uh, is happening, but it's not when they go out there. But I think you, you should have some reasonable basis for um, believing there's a need for a hearing before you're binding yourself to. I mean, right now it's shell. Every time a complaint comes in, you have to hold a hearing. That's an awful burden to put on the township every time, regardless of the, the merits of the complaint. And I, and I think you got to assume the township's going to operate in good faith in making that. It, you're going to want to protect your residents and not just say, no, we're not believing any of these complaints. Um, and you're, you're in control of the process, so it's not like the applicant gets to decide what is and isn't valid. Just take out a challenge for what? Well, it's, it requires a little more significant redrafting than that, but the idea is to give you have to make a discretionary decision about whether you go forward with the complaint based on it being a valid one, or at least something that has reasonable merit. Yeah. So basically, has reasonable merit. basically that first paragraph needs to be redrafted. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's really C that's the, yeah. the problem. That's the one that says the township board shall set a public hearing. And then, like, split that off from a public hearing for hearing of complaints. Yeah, like, stop. to make the community aware that someone has a concern. Yeah, that might stop frivolous complaints that way, too. If somebody just distills it over and over and over. I guess I'm not understanding what you're saying. Like, oh, from somewhere. like if you... If if you had a complaint and to protect from it just being disregarded, to say, we've received a complaint about this tower, you know, um, maybe there's someone else that experienced the same thing and doesn't know what to you do. You just need to add an extra step in there is what you're trying to do. To be able to post it on something. To, to be able to say, you know. Yeah complaint received on this tower, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's oil, maybe it's, right. and someone else says, well, I saw it too, you know, is. Just you got to remember all them steps take time to process. Yeah. So it could be three months down the road before That's you true. actually get to the complaint. Your, your concerns are very understandable in ensuring that you know uh, complaints are taken seriously. But there's a certain level of diminishing returns on the administrative burden you're putting on the township to publish every complaint that comes in in the newspaper. I mean, that's you're going to have to develop the uh, you know the township department of, uh, of uh, wind complaints that operates full time if you put too much into this. So then 34 is done. Uh, well, under compliance, paragraph A, uh, the last yeah. sentence there says non-compliance with ordinance requirements uh, shall result in denial or revocation of the permit, meaning the special use permit. might be a, a one-time uh, situation where they exceeded the flicker limits or something like that uh, that doesn't warrant revoking their special use permit. 
So I think uh, just inserting the word may instead of shall still gives you the option of doing it uh, under appropriate circumstances, but doesn't require that you do it in all cases. Can you just point out what number in the letter that was? Yeah, I'm not finding it. It's under 10A. That's, uh, 10A. Oh, under compliance, paragraph A. Okay. same section under paragraphs B and C, we use the terms nuisance compliance complaint and non-nuisance compliance, um, which I don't think are defined. No, they're not. Um, so they should be. Uh, I mean, we need to have an understanding of what the difference is between a nuisance compliance complaint and a non-nuisance compliant. It, to me, non-nuisance implies a fairly minor uh, item that may be uh, handled administratively rather than going through the whole township board review and hiring experts and, and all of that. Um, so I, I think we, if we're going to use the terms, we, we ought to have a, some understanding of what, what's included in each. So you're going to define that somehow. And, and any guidance you have for me in terms of what you were thinking uh, of, as to what's a nuisance and what's a non-nuisance. We don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> and well, I've got carte blanche to yeah. define it. A non-nuisance. The one I can think of is I've mentioned like the oil. You, you can see it, you know it's not right, but it doesn't have to do with sound, shadow, or what somebody's done to your property, you know, by driving, disturbing. Where in, in my mind, that's the first thing I thought of when you said what's a non nuisance mechanical, you know, blade 